I gave it the best soil. I gave it a protection around it. I gave the cultivation and I had people get the stones and dig around it. And I planted the choicest vine, the best vine. And the Bible says, even then it did not produce the fruit that he was expecting. Now, I want you to stick with me because this is coming together. So we go back to the, to the gospel of Luke. In chapter 13, we look at our parable. It says he told this parable that a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. So in other words, he wanted this fig tree to have the best soil. It's going to be fertile ground. It's not going to have any stones. So there's nothing that could prevent this thing from being Same able to bear well. fruit. He gave it the, the best title issue. of our message uh, today is never would have made it never would have made it. Let's go ahead and pray as we invite God's spirit to be with us in his word. Mighty God, everlasting father, we are so privileged to have audience with you. Lord, we are not here to listen to the words of a man. We want to hear the word of God. Like those Greeks that came on the days of Eve before the death of our Lord, they told the disciples and Philip that, sir, we would see Jesus. So, Father, we pray that you would answer this request and that the sweet, sweet spirit of Jesus would fall upon every soul that is tuning in by phone, tablet, or computer, listening only by audio or by social media, YouTube or Facebook. And Lord, we pray that he would move in every heart and in every mind. And God, that you would show that there is no distance that the good gospel of Jesus cannot reach, that the word of God is powerful. And Lord, it is able to cut hearts near and far. So Father, you've brought us together for this moment and we pray that we would hear from you so that we may leave this place saying, if God ever spoke by a man, he spoke this day. We love you and we thank you for hearing and answering this prayer. And we offer this prayer from our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. As I mentioned, next week will be 21 years since I've surrendered my life to the Lord in baptism. And in this message that we have entitled, Never Would Have Made It. And I think about the fact that there is an understanding that many people have that great suffering happens to people because they are great sinners. I don't know if you've ever heard or been familiar with this, but there are people who actually believe that great suffering means that you are a great sinner. The entire book of Job is based upon this argument and debate between Job and his friends. That Job, you're suffering greatly because you must be a great sinner. When we think about the, the, the experiences even of life right now, and sometimes in, in churches and in spiritual communities, people can say, well, her daughter got pregnant outside of marriage. And so there must be something spiritually wrong with the parents because my daughter did not. And so we assume that great suffering, great tragedy is because you are a great sinner. I want to take our reading today from the book of Luke chapter 13. And in Luke chapter 13, Beginning in verse one, the Bible says there were some present at that very time who told him that is Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? So Jesus asked the question when they raised it to him, Jesus could sense sort of the undertone. You ever talk to a person before and they're saying something, but you kind of sense something else is kind of behind that, right? It's like when people use prayer requests as a means of gossiping. Oh, you know, did you, you know, we need to pray for sister such and such. 
It's like, really, are, are you really interested in praying for this person? Or are you just trying to spread some juicy gossip? And Jesus, in, a, in, in, in all of his discernment and spiritual eyesight, was able to perceive that behind what these people were bringing to him, oh, did you hear about this, what Pilate did to these individuals, and he mingled their blood with their sacrifices, Jesus sensed, I know what you're trying to imply. You're trying to imply that this happened to them because they were worse sinners than everybody else. You see, interestingly enough, in this story and passage, going to the altar of God was a place that people believed that they were safe. It was a place that they believed that I'm going to worship God. And so I'm not worried about any danger. I'm not worried about suffering any tragedy because I'm kneeling at this altar in a vulnerable place. And so that term, that concept of being safe in the sanctuary of God in a place of worship continues even unto this day where individuals can claim sanctuary. This is how individuals who are being dispersed from their country because of war crimes or because of being mistreated or because of an authoritarian regime that is rip shotting through a nation and ravaging its own people, we can say they can claim sanctuary. Because the belief is that a place of worship was even off limits to the exploits of war. But Pilate seemed to cross that line where Pilate almost ambushed a group of people who maybe they were speaking against the Roman Empire. Maybe they were creating a, a sort of a rabble and a sort of kerfuffle throughout Israel. And this, 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 this governor decided that, you know what, the best time for me to get these people is while they're worshiping, not suspecting, not armed. And he decided to kill them to the point that their blood splashed onto the altar that they were offering to God, which we know that giving your own life, giving your own blood on the altar to God does not atone for your sins. So, so the understanding here is only a sinner's blood falls upon the altar because they did not accept and receive the blood of Jesus. So this individual, Pilate kills these people and this is spread all the way around town and it gets to Jesus's ears and he senses from these tail bearers, do you believe that these individuals were worse sinners than all other Galileans? Notice what Jesus says in verse three, I tell you no. So Jesus is 100% against this ideology that great suffering means that you are a great sinner. He goes on to another story that he shares with them. But before that, he says, but unless you repent. Now, in the King James Version, it says ye and ye is old English for you all. So what that means is Jesus saying, everyone who's talking to me and everyone who can hear me, unless you all repent, you will all likewise perish. So here we recognize that unless you all repent, you all will perish. So in other words, you're going to die in the same way. But notice verse four, Jesus adds another story he says in verse 4 or 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 what about those 18 on whom the tower in siloam fell and killed them do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in jerusalem so now he moves from galilee to jerusalem you see they 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 thought to themselves well and jesus is so wise because he understands people are like looking down upon the Galileans, right? But all of the priests, all of the higher spiritual elite classes were in Jerusalem near the temple. So when these individuals are thinking, well, it's just these Galileans, right? The fishermen, the lower class people in Israel, in the church. And God forbid that we have also classes in the church where we separate people by their profession. Well, you're a lawyer, so you can be an elder, but you're a carpenter, so you should be a deacon. Well, you're an individual who works at McDonald's, and so you have nothing spiritually to contribute to the church. And in this sort of classism that was existing, Jesus said, okay, let's go to Jerusalem. Let's not even stick with Galilee. Let's go ahead and get to Jerusalem. And he says, what about those people who are literally at the temple and the tower of Siloam fell upon those 18 people and killed them. Do you think 
Jesus says that they were worse sinners than all the other people in Jerusalem. And Jesus answers his own question. He says, I tell you no, but unless you all repent, you will all likewise perish. You see, Jesus recognized that human beings have this subtle belief that great suffering means that you are a great sinner. I remember listening to a sister that I ran into in an airport and her husband had passed away. She was in health ministry, medical missionary work and was doing extremely well. God was blessing her and her husband and her husband passed away. And I was traveling to California and we were there at the same hotel. I mean, at the same airport in the lounge together. And I said, wow, how are you doing sister? And, and I, I was so thankful that God had arranged this divine appointment because I wanted to see how she was doing since her husband's passing. And as we began to talk, my heart was broken by the things that she was sharing with me. That she took a while to take time off from the ministry, but she felt that it would be in the best interest of honoring her husband to continue on in her ministry. And while she was in ministry in speaking afterwards, people would come to her and during the mingling and conversational time, they would say things to her like, well, are you sure he was really vegan? Are you sure he was actually really vegetarian? Maybe he was hiding meat from you. Maybe he was hiding other bad habits. Maybe he was a smoker because he died from cancer. And I, I want you to imagine in your mind how a person would have the audacity to tell a woman who lost her husband to cancer that maybe perhaps he wasn't really who you thought he was. That's why he died of cancer. Because it's impossible for a person to think these are individuals who love the Lord, who are attending medical missionary training in seminars. These are people who want to do the ministry, yet they're coming to an individual and saying, well, he suffered a great suffering. Therefore, he must have been a great sinner. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. People who have this mindset. And the ability to bring that type of criticism and pain to another individual because of this false belief. You must have done something in order for you to be suffering. And we can already see why Jesus would be so opposed to this idea. Because this is the same Jesus who talked to them about all of the prophets all the way up into his time into John that were killed through crazy means and persecution. So are we going to say that because Abel was murdered in cold blood by his own brother, that he must have been a great sinner? Are we going to say that Isaiah, who was sawed in half, must have been because he was a great sinner? Well, Job, you know, he he was sitting here trying to take care of his family and serve all of the community. He was the greatest man of the East, but he must have been a great sinner. And what about Jesus himself? So are we to conclude that this three-day mockery of a trial being dragged between Pilate and Herod and back to Pilate and then eventually beaten, slashed, and thrashed with the cat of nine tails, 40 lashes minus one, spat upon, spearing your side. Are we to conclude that Jesus must have been a greater sinner than everybody else in Jerusalem because he had great suffering? Jesus is essentially telling us First of all, this idea is no, but see, brothers and sisters, we're not going to get away that easy by thinking, oh no, brother Sebastian, I don't believe that. I, I've never said anything like that. I would never say that to that dear sister who lost her husband. But you see, sometimes, and, 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 and anyone in mental health will know this, and I'm sure Atante would testify to this, that individuals are willing to tell themselves things they would never allow themselves to say to someone else or allow someone else to say to them. We can be even harsher with ourselves than we can be to other people. So I, I've never done that because you may be thinking to yourself, well, Lord, I didn't have as much time in prayer and in Bible study this morning. That's why all of a sudden things went to hell in a handbasket at my job. Well, it, it, it must be the, the fact that me and my husband are having all these arguments and fights with my, my young teenage daughter. It must be, Lord, that you know what? I knew I should have just gone ahead to prayer me because, you know, I'm a great sinner. Therefore, I must be having great suffering. 
we automatically tell ourselves the idea that the reason why we're going through something is because we've done something wrong. But this is not the belief. This is not the God in which we worship. This is not the truth of the word of God. This is a pagan concept. The idea that a God who needs to be appeased and when you haven't met his quota of pleasing, therefore he starts removing these blessings. He starts removing these good things out of your life. And all of a sudden everything starts going amok. Oh, wait, let me go ahead and bring another sacrifice to the altar of God. When we recognize you and I could bring nothing to God. This is why the prophet Micah said with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I give my firstborn the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? I want you to think of it. Think about this. We ask this question and this is how we approach it. With what shall I come before the Lord? And he says, he has shown you, oh man, what the Lord does require of you. And it is not your firstborn. It is not the fruit of the, your body for the sin of your soul. God does not require this blood of you. Jesus has paid the price, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Can you say amen? We, we, we have to step back and, and, and step away from this ideology because we subtly believe it in our everyday life. We act as if God is trying to make our life difficult. We act as if God is a transition transactional being. Well, if I pray and do my devotions before 7 a.m., then this means that the rest of my day is going to be this way. And if I find a way to, you know, make sure that I'm staying on top of these aspects of the health message all the time, 24 seven, then therefore I will be prevented from disease and health catastrophe. But brothers and sisters, I got news for you. Jesus says that great sufferers does not mean that you're a great sinner. Amen. Hallelujah. Because I don't know about you, but I've been in the valley before. I've been in that place when things have been all darkness around me. I've been in that place where everybody around you is thinking, man, what is going on in Sebastian's life? Because this is some crazy stuff going on. And they're starting to wonder and think in themselves, man, what is going on in his private life? Maybe there's something in secret we don't know about. Maybe there's an Aiken in the camp. He's an Aiken in the camp. And this is why this is happening to them. And as you're going through this time, you start thinking, man, maybe there is something wrong with me. Maybe I'm not doing enough. Maybe I'm not sacrificing enough. Maybe I'm not giving enough offering. Maybe I'm not preaching enough sermons. Maybe I'm not accepting enough appointments. Maybe I'm not doing enough Bible studies. Because great suffering means I'm a great sinner. And this subtle belief is a misunderstanding of what tragedy is supposed to say to us. Jesus says that when there is a tragedy, he says, this is actually a warning. He says, when these individuals died at the altar, he says there in verse four, going into verse five, he says, no, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So in other words, Jesus is trying to communicate to us that the tragedies in the life of other people is a warning sign to us that we will suffer the same fate if we do not repent. In other words, these individuals are suffering because of a sin filled world because sin is in the world. They're not worse sinners than me because they suffered these things. The reason why her teenage daughter got pregnant outside of wedlock is not because they're a more sinful family than my own. It is a cautionary tale to me to say, hey, if you do not repent, you will all so likewise perish. You will also suffer the same fate. So in other words, Jesus is trying to communicate to us is that when I see this tragedy, when I see suffering in another person's life, it is not for me to reflect upon what's going on in their life, but it is a call for me to reflect upon what's going on in my life. I need to say that again. When I see tragedy and suffering in the life of another person, it is a call by God for me not to figure out what's going on in their life, but to sit down and ask the question, what's going on in my life? Have I repented of all my sins? Because the only way to avoid perishing is repentance, Jesus says. And repentance, according to Acts chapter 5, is a gift. Jesus was exalted as a prince and a savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. 
That means you can't give something if a person already has it or can produce it. Why is Jesus giving us repentance if we can produce repentance? Because we can't. So the recognition is that I need to think to myself, why did I not suffer this tragedy? Because if they're not worse sinners than me, I could have easily shared the same fate. It could have been my day in Jerusalem at the altar, which Pilate decided to kill. It could have been the blind man in John chapter 9 that Jesus said, I want you to go wash in the pool of Siloam in order to regain your sight. And the tower could have fell even then. But you see, in each of these individual situations, these individuals were not worse sinners because they suffered it. It was a reminder to me that I am also a sinner and I'm just as bad as a sinner as those individuals who suffered. So the question is not why did it happen to them? The question is why did it not happen to me? I hope you're hearing me today. We went through that prayer list. We listed all the prayer requests, all the individuals grappling with cancer, people in hospice, people battling diseases, people battling tragedies. People battling problems with career, battling problems in marriage, battling problems in their home, battling problems in their health, battling problems in their business. And these individuals that are going through this suffering, yes, we want to pray for them. Yes, we want to ask God to move in their life. But it is also an opportunity to reflect on my own situation and say, Lord, why am I not going through that? Because I'm just as bad of a sinner, according to Jesus. And because I'm just as bad of a sinner as them, I should have suffered the same fate. But Jesus says, I don't think you really get the point. So he ends with a parable. And this is where I want to bring my sermon to its head. He says in verse six of Luke chapter 13, he says, and he told this parable, a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came seeking fruit on it. And he found how much he found none. And the Bible says, and he said to the vine dresser or the gardener, look for these three years. Now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and I find none cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? I like the King James version. Cause it says, why does it cumber the ground? In other words, he's like, why is this thing a burden to the soil? And then the gardener answered him and said, sir, let it alone this year also. Or the King James says, spare it this year also until I dig around it and put on some manure. And he says, then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if it does not, you can cut it down. So I want you to think about this, right? So Jesus says, okay, I'm, I'm talking to you about great suffering and great sinners and that these are not equivalent, and that when you see tragedy happening, the question is, why is it not happening to you? Then he goes to tell this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. Now, you may be asking yourself this question. First of all, a vineyard is for what? For grapes. That's what you grow in a vineyard. And the Bible tells us in, in, in the book of Isaiah chapter five, that God had a blessed and beloved vineyard. Okay. If you want to keep your finger here, I want you to turn with me there to the book of Isaiah chapter five. And I just want you to read exactly what God says about this vineyard, how he describes it, its experience. Isaiah chapter five, beginning in verse one, the Bible says, let me sing for my beloved, my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. So in other words, the, the, the Bible's telling us that if you're going to plant a vineyard, you can't just grow grapes any place. Grapes are only grown, grown in a certain type of soil in a certain type of climate. There has to be a frost. There has to be this. When I've gone to Germany, or I was recently in Cape Town, South Africa, I mean, they have more than 30 vineyards, right? You could visit a different vineyard every day and it would take you more than a month to see all the vineyards in Cape Town in South Africa. So here you have the fact that a vineyard requires a certain type of soil, certain type of climate, certain type of weather and all kinds of things, but especially the soil must be very dense nutri nutrient wise. It has to be very fertile. And he says, and he dug it in verse two and he cleared it of stones. So here he goes and he says, first of all, if you want to grow a vineyard, you got to get the best soil. 
And then when you get in that soil, you got to get all the stones out so that it can get depth so that this thing can really take root and really get into the richness of the soil and the fertility of this ground to really produce really good grapes. And not only that, as he cultivated it, it says then he planted it with the choicest vines. That means he put the best vine in there, the best grapes that it could possibly grow. And then he built a watchtower in the midst of it. So now there's a tower to protect it. So he's protecting this thing. And then it goes on to say, and he hewed out a wine vat in it and he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. Now, verse three, and now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard, God says. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? Now, this is a sermon for a whole nother time, but Jesus essentially comes to the point to say he's comparing his people, the house of Israel, to a vineyard. And he says, what is it that I have not done to allow this thing to produce the grapes that I'm expecting it to bear? What is it that I haven't done? He says, I want you to judge between me and my vineyard. What is it that I haven't done? I gave it the best soil. I gave it a protection around it. I gave the cultivation and I had people get the stones and dig around it. And I planted the choicest vine, the best vine. And the Bible says, even then it did not produce the fruit that he was expecting. Now I want you to stick with me because this is coming together. So we go back to the, to the gospel of Luke in chapter 13. We look at our parable. It says he told this parable that a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. So in other words, he wanted this fig tree to have the best soil. It's going to be fertile ground. It's not going to have any stones. So there's nothing that could prevent this thing from being able to bear fruit. He gave it the best situation, the best environment and the best opportunity. And he says, and he came seeking fruit on it and he found none. Now, something you may not know is that fig trees typically bear fruit five to six times a year. This is how many times you normally come. So if you think about it, he says, I've come three years seeking fruit upon this fig tree and found none. So let's just assume that this fig tree is supposed to bear fruit six times a year times three years. That's 18 times that he's come to this fig tree and it has zero figs. And the Bible says he tells the gardener, he tells Jesus and he says, look, for three years, 18 times, I've been trying to come and buy fruit off of this fig tree. And how many times has he gotten fruit? Zero. Zero times this fig tree has borne fruit. Now, I want you to really take this in for a second. Best soil, best environment. Who is a better gardener than Jesus? And you could honestly say, what more could he have done to help it to bear fruit? And the Bible says, therefore, he's had enough. And he says, cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? So a tree that is planted in a vineyard that is not bearing fruit, he says, not only is it not giving me any fruit, he says, it is actually a positive hindrance. It is burdening the ground. It is using up the resources. I can go ahead and remove this tree. Get a tree that will take the same nutrients, drink the same sunlight, drink the same water and produce fruit. So now he says, cut it down. Why is this thing burdening the ground, taking up all the resources and producing nothing? And notice what he said. He answered him and said, this is what the gardener says. This is what Jesus says. He says, sir, spare it this year also. I just want you to think about this phrase for a minute. Spare it this year also. So what he's saying is all the other years that he came, what did the man say when he found no fruit on it? Cut it down. So in other words, I've spared this tree before. I've been merciful to this tree before. And now the gardener is saying to the owner of the vineyard, he says, Lord, I want, sir, I want you to spare it this year also, 
You spared it the first year. You spared it the second year. You spared it the third year. It should have been cut down. It should have been cut down. It should have been cut down because it wasn't bearing fruit. Spare it this year also. And then watch what happens. This is what he says. He says, until I dig about it and dung it and give manure around this thing. So in other words, I want you to process this in your brain. Jesus says, maybe there's something I have not done as to why it's not bearing fruit. He takes the blame upon himself. So in other words, connecting the stories, Jesus said, these people are not worse sinners. So that means a sinner is a tree that does not bear fruit. I need you to stick with me. A person who is sinning is a person who comes short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, which means all have sinned. And if all have sinned, then all are sinners. And because people are sinners, they are fruitless trees. So for all those years before you gave your life to Jesus, for all those years that before you decided to make a full surrender, you got to ask yourself, how is it that I was not cut down there before? The answer is very, very clear. You never would have made it had it not been for the heavenly gardener. For this tree, the tree would have never made it to year number four had it not had a gardener that loved that tree and said, it's not the tree's fault. Maybe there's something else I need to give the tree. So you see, there are some of us who have not borne fruit in our marriages. We know that were it not for the Lord and had it never been for God intervening in my marriage, my marriage would have collapsed and fallen apart. Some of us know that we should have died from breast cancer. Our cancer should have metastasized, but had it not been for the Lord, we never would have made it. Had Jesus not intervened and told God, said, no, don't cut it down this year. I need you to spare it this year also. Some of us need to recognize that when you were driving on the highway and that accident happened right in front of you or that accident happened right behind you, guess what? You never would have made it had Jesus not intervened and said, no, spare it this year also. Some of us in our businesses, your, your business would have gone down. You would have lost all the money, all the employees during COVID-19, a whole bunch of businesses closed down. But praise God, when you're going through this time of a pandemic, some people's businesses were growing while other people's businesses were dying. J.C. Penney was filing bankruptcy while somebody's ministry, who was a child of God, serving the kingdom of God, trying to bring blessings from God and to glorify God, their business was prospering. Can you say amen? And wondering the case, well, why is my business not going down under? Because the Jesus said, spare it this year also. I need you to understand this in your mind right now, in your spiritual life. We have neglected the word of God. We have neglected prayer. We've neglected the evangelism and the ministry that we have been called upon to do. Some of us have not reached out to our neighbors. Some of us have not reached out to our coworkers. Some of us have not borne fruit in evangelism. And God says, I'm come looking for fruit and found none. Spare it this year also. And guess what? You never would have made it. without Jesus. You never would have made it. Brothers and sisters, Jesus doesn't pray to never cut down the tree. That's not what he says. He says, I agree. If it continues not to bear fruit, cut it down. So in other words, Jesus is saying to connect the two stories. When someone suffers their life being killed at the altar, when a tower falls upon them and they suffer tragedy, what is Jesus saying? That tree was cut down. And people are asking, man, what was wrong with that tree? That tree probably wasn't bearing fruit. He probably ain't give no figs. And Jesus saying, guess what? You also a fruitless fig tree. God has been coming looking for fruit in your marriage. Your wife has been looking for the fruit of love, joy, kindness, peace, patience. Your kids have been looking for the fruit of love, joy, peace, kindness, patience, temperance. And you haven't born any. And yet God has spared you 
this year also. In other words, you never would have made it without Jesus. Brothers and sisters, God, every birthday that we celebrate, every year that we see another year, every time that we get to celebrate and listen to people sing happy birthday, or for me, next week, it is my rebirthday. And every time I come upon that moment, I think about the fact I never would have made it had it not been for Jesus. I never would have made it. And for you and I, we never would have made it to this day, to this moment, had it not been for the Lord interceding on your behalf as the heavenly gardener. And even though you and I have not borne fruit, Jesus says, maybe there's something else I could have done to help you be a better husband. Maybe there's something I could do around you to make you a better wife. Maybe there's something I could, I could dig around you and maybe dung this thing in order to help you to be a better missionary. Maybe there's something I could have done to make you a better witness for my name. Jesus takes the blame upon himself. Sweet Jesus. Jesus says, the reason why Sebastian is not bearing fruit is my fault. It's my fault. The reason why this sister struggling with her health, Lord, and not being willing to make the necessary changes in her diet, make the necessary changes in her lifestyle. Jesus says, it's my fault. There's something I need to do, Lord, so spare it this year also. Brothers and sisters, Jesus said, when you see another tree cut down, ask yourself, am I bearing fruit? Where am I fruitless in my own life? Where am I not bearing fruit to God? Where has Jesus been merciful to me and said, spare it this year also? I remember when I was uh, first getting baptized. I was baptized, as I said, April 6th, 2002. Within 30 days of my baptism, my stepfather died. My mom found him. She went for a run. She came home and he was dead in the bed. And um, I remember getting the call from my mom to hear that my stepfather had passed away. And then, so this was April, the end of April, now going into May and June. Then my grandmother became sick with cancer. They said, oh, it should be fine. She should be able to make it. And then I remember immediately uh, following this, I decided to come stay with my mom in order to support and to be present. And the interesting thing was, is that when I got there a week later, my grandmother died. Just all of a sudden, the cancer just advanced and boom, she was dead. They started to plan the funeral. Two weeks later, um, they had the funeral from my grandmother. That, gr that funeral was on a Sunday. That following Tuesday in October of the same year that I was baptized, my 20-year-old cousin, Amy was her name, from South Carolina. She was eight and a half months pregnant. She was driving and while she was waiting at a, an intersection, an 18 wheeler truck was making a right turn, crushed her car into the wall of a building, just kept turning. By the time they pulled her out, she didn't make it. And the baby didn't make it three days after we buried my grandmother. This is the end of October. Now going into November. Now we're planning the funeral for my cousin after we just buried my grandmother. After this, my dad calls me and says, hey, I want to take you up to meet your, your grandfather, my dad's dad. And my dad never really knew who his father was. And so finally he had gotten reconnected with him and that side of the family. And so he said, Sebastian, I want you as my firstborn to meet my dad. And that way we can have a, a generational connection. So I said, sure. And as we're in this generational connection, we're driving up to see my grandfather. And as we're driving up to see my grandfather, 
he dies an hour before I arrive. So instead of going to meet my grandfather, I end up going to bury him. This is in November. As I'm returning from my grandfather's funeral, my great aunt passes away and my uncle dies. The same weekend. The interesting thing about this experience is while we were burying my grandfather, all my cousins were coming in and they said, Sebastian, you know, ever since you gave your life to Jesus, people started dying in the family. I thought that because you gave your life to God, that you start following him, that he would bless you. But nobody died in the family until you decided to give your life to Jesus. This is the discussion that I'm having with my cousins. Why is it that after this has happened, all of this tragedy comes, comes to bow? And we know why, brothers and sisters. And I knew why. Because guess what? When you are out there in the world doing your own thing, the devil left you alone. Because now that you give your life to Jesus, the devil, Ellen White tells us that the devil is going to fight you for every inch of ground on your way back to the heavenly kingdom. And therefore, some of us think to our minds that, well, I gave my life to Jesus. Therefore, Jesus, the devil is just going to pat you on the back and wish you well. No, he's not. So as I'm talking to my cousins, they're thinking to themselves, all of this tragedy must mean there was something wrong with the people who died. And now that Sebastian gave his life to Jesus, and now that he's a Christian, all these people are dying in the family. So there must be something wrong with Sebastian failing to recognize what Jesus is saying is that all of this tragedy was to reflect upon how are you not bearing fruit in your own life? Are you aware of the mercy of God in your own life? Are you aware of the fact that you never would have made it had it not been for Jesus? Because the reality is you would have lost it all. And as the old gospel song says, but now I see that Jesus was there for me. So I never would have made it without you. And he says, I would have lost it all. But now I see that Jesus was there for me. Brothers and sisters, it's only in heaven that we will fully understand all of the ways that angels and God and heaven has intervened to prevent many a tragedy in our lives when we could have been cut down. Why is it that my grandmother or my stepfather or my 21-year-old cousin, when I was a kid and I was in a gang and my best friend was shot to death and his mother, 60-something bullets in the same neighborhood, why is it that I, who was in the gang, my friend who was not in the gang, ended up dead, but I somehow lived? Because God said, spare him this year also. Brothers and sisters, today is a day to remind yourself of all the tragedy that we're seeing in the world, of all the tragedy that is around us and in our communities. We need to reflect upon our own life. Where am I not bearing fruit? Where are the places where God came and said, cut it down? Why is this thing cumbering the ground? We come to living manna. We got mental health Mondays. We got health on Tuesdays. We got prayer meeting with Brother Terry. We got, you know, Dr. Pondit and learning about God. And we got the sermons in Living Man of Sabbath School and on and on and on. And God is saying, I placed you in the best soil. I've given you the best resources. I've given you the best support in online community, people you can connect with from all over the world, different cultures, different races, different genders, different ages, different locations, different cultures. And you're uniting together in worship to God and you get to know that these people are praying for you. The prayer team behind Brother Terry and all these people are praying for your prayer requests. And God is saying, what more could I have done that I have not done? But many of us are not bearing fruit. And God has spared us this year also. So today, God is calling us to reflect. God is calling us to look at the tragedy around us and saying, Lord, where am I not bearing fruit? And now I see, Lord, that my cousin who died 
my aunt who passed away, my friend who ended up in a tragedy or lost their job, their business closed down. Lord, I never would have made it without you. I just want to ask, as we bring this sermon to a close, you're sitting there reflecting right now and saying, Lord, I never would have made it without Jesus. I just want you to go ahead and go into the chat and just say, thank you, Lord. Say, just, I just want to thank you, Lord. I just want to say thank you. Because you didn't have to spare me this year also. You didn't have to be this good. You didn't have to be this kind. You did not have to be merciful. Because those people who suffered were not worse sinners than me. I'm the same. And when I see other trees cut down, Lord, I see, yes, it is a tragedy and I grieve and I mourn for the loss, but it is also a reminder to me that the Lord spared me this year also. And so if you just want to say right now, you say, I don't know the tragedy. I don't know the health situation. I don't know the marital problem. I don't know the business issue. I don't know the job problem that you, I don't know the spiritual issues that you've been facing, but you know, as you're listening and watching right now, and you know in your mind that, you know what? I never would have made it had it not been for the Lord. And if that is the truth, Jesus says, then as Jesus digs around you, as he continues to work in your life, he says, now live a life to bear fruit to his glory. Now live a life to bear fruit to his glory. So that when God comes, when that second coming happens and he says, I've been looking for fruit on this tree, Jesus says, Lord, spare it this year also. And God will rejoice and say, yes, finally, the fruit that I've been waiting for. So if you want to say right now, you say, Lord, I just want to say thank you. You can go ahead and put that in the chat. Say, Lord, I never would have made it without you. But you also want to make a commitment to Jesus. And that commitment to Jesus is that, Lord, help me to bear fruit in the areas of my life where I'm not bearing fruit. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's your work. Maybe it's your spiritual life or your ministry or evangelism. Maybe it's your health. Maybe it's emotionally and your mental health. Maybe it's, it's just dealing with safety and other aspects of your life that are consuming your time and your attention, your family, your, your parenting. You want to say, Lord, help me to bear fruit in these areas that are fruitless right now. Help me to receive the ministry of Jesus, the rich soil that he's placed me in, the ways that he's working around me for me to bear fruit to his glory and to bear fruit for him. If that is your prayer, I just want you to go ahead and just put a raised hand in the chat or you can say, please, Lord, help me to bear fruit by your grace and through your mercy. God hears and God sees wherever you are in the world whatever device you're watching from and whatever ways the spirit of God is moving in your life, God sees and God knows. And God is able to help you and me to bear fruit in those fruitless parts of our lives. As we reflect and we say, thank you, Lord. I never would have made it without you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I just want to say thank you. We just want to say thank you that we never would have made it without you. We would have lost it all. But now we see that Jesus was there for us. Now we see that Jesus was the one who spared our marriages. Jesus was the one who spared our health. He was the one who spared our businesses and our careers our spiritual lives. Some of us almost walked away from Jesus and gave up hope. But Father, today we see that you were there for us the whole time. And even when we are failing, you take it upon yourself to say, I think there's more than I can do. But Lord, we know you will not labor and plead and intercede forever. For even Jesus agrees that a fruitless tree that never bears fruit eventually should be cut down as well. 
So Lord, as we're in this time of probation, where this mercy will not last forever, Lord, we just want to say thank you, but we want us, we also want to say that we want to bear fruit, a fruit that comes from a spirit of gratitude, a fruit that comes from a spirit of thankfulness for you. So Lord, we pray that you would help us to bear fruit through the indwelling of your Holy Spirit, that we may bear fruit to your glory in whatever areas that we are fruitless now. And Father, whenever we are tempted to walk away, whenever we are tempted to leave, remind us that we never would have made it without you. This is our prayer, and we offer this prayer from our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen.